We normally talk about transition metal chemistry as being the chemistry of partially filled D orbitals. D orbitals have two nodal planes and they're very much directional in three-dimensional space. And this directionality that D orbitals has has all sorts of consequences for our chemistry. So the D orbitals fall into two main classes. They fall into the class of orbital that lies between the axes. So here we have the YZ, the XY and the XZ those orbitals are lying between our set of atomic coordinate axes that we've defined. We have two other orbitals, the dz squared orbital and the dx squared minus y squared orbital, where those orbitals point directly along the set of axes that we've defined. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because if we're considering an octahedral coordination, and normally in transition metal chemistry, we will be considering an octahedral coordination of ligands. And then in an octahedral coordination of ligands, essentially what you've got is a ligand sitting at the top and the bottom, at the left and the right of each of these axes. So in the case of these three orbitals, the orbitals are pointing between the ligands, and in the case of these two orbitals, the orbitals are pointing right at the ligands. Right, now why is it that transition metals are so conducive, so useful, so frequently found as catalysts? Well, one point is their ability to adopt variable oxidation states. The other point that goes hand in hand with this is the ability to form different geometries using those d orbitals. Those d orbitals sometimes in combination with other atomic orbitals, but frequently the d orbitals can be arranged in various fashions to get various geometries. So the ones that you've probably encountered will be tetrahedral, so you would have come across examples of tetrahedral transition metal complexes. Most, the vast majority actually, of transition metal complexes are actually, certainly in aqueous solution, octahedral. So the, by far the most important geometry of transition metal complexes is octahedral. And we see a lot of transition metal chemistry driven by a desire, if you like, to get six ligands in the coordination sphere. So most classical coordination chemistry is octahedral chemistry. Tetrahedral is important under special circumstances, and there are quite a few of these special circumstances, but certain classes of compound tend to ad adopt square planar <coughs> geometries. So the three most important classes of geometry that you find in transition metal in order, I guess, of importance would be octahedral followed closely by a tie between tetrahedral and square planar. But you have great, much greater flexibility in transition metal chemistry. You can, given the right ligand sets, the right metal, find all sorts of other geometries. Well, how do I predict the geometry of a transition metal compound? In transition metal chemistry, you don't have to worry about lone pairs. All that you have to do is arrange the ligands in space around your transition metal to minimize it. Generally in transition metal chemistry, just count the ligands and arrange them in space as far apart as possible. So using the kind of skills that you learn in VSEPR, but without a preoccupation for lone pairs. As soon as you start getting beyond six ligands, to six ligands, seven ligands, eight ligands, nine ligands, then what you need to, what you would have to have is a large transition metal ion and a small ligand. If you've got large ligands, you are not, or even medium-sized ligands, you are not going to exceed a coordination number of six. So these are rather exotic species. And there are examples of coordination number eight and coordination number nine, but only with very small ligands. The only example of a metal compound I know with a coordination number of nine is rhenium, rhenium being a uh, larger transition metal ion with nine hydride ligands around it. So the smallest ligand that we can imagine and one of the largest transition metal ions in order to get to these numbers.